What is up, dude? How's it going, man? Thanks for having me on, Jay. <laughs> yeah, no problem, man. Thanks for coming. I'm super excited for this one. I was really happy when I was when I heard that uh, you were going to be able to come on uh, at least this season because I want to have you back. I want to I want to see this journey from the next step that you got planned. I'm I'm really excited and happy for you. Um, but let's go ahead and, and jump right into it. Like I was telling you before, um, and if you're just new to this channel, uh, what we do is we have them introduce itself, we ask some questions, and at the end we have our audience Q and A. And we like to start at the very beginning. So, but before we jump in, introduce yourself, your name, and your title, and where you're working. All right, my name is Dr. Brandon Carpenter. I am a postdoctoral research fellow, and I am currently carrying out my research at Emory University uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, in awesome. David Katz lab. Um, so. Cool, man. So what we're going to do is we're going to start at your childhood. So tell me about where you grew up, any siblings, and, and everything uh, that happened uh, that led you up into high school. All right. Yeah, man. So I grew up um, same small town as you did, uh, uh, Cherryville, North Carolina. It's about 45 minutes southwest of Charlotte. Um, you know, one elementary school, one middle school, uh, one high school, and, you know, 10 Baptist churches. That's where we came <laughs> from, man. Um, so it was a tiny town, man, a beautiful town. Um, I have one stepsister uh, who's eight years younger than me. I grew up in a uh, pretty middle class um, upbringing, pretty standard issue. Um, I was a first generation college student. Um, so that has been, we can talk about that later on, you know, some of the struggles with the whole journey of becoming a professor have been trying to, um, you know, overcome sort of being the first to go to college and to be in the, you know, those big classrooms, learning stuff in a pretty intimidating environment um, when I first started out. Um, so, yeah, you know, the good thing about Cherryville High School, this tiny high school that we're from is um, we had excellent teachers. We did. Uh, and I think there's where I started getting the wheels turning a little bit um, about what I was going to do with my career. And I don't know if you remember, but we had a, um, a very transient teacher, Corbin West, was amazing. there when we were there. And this guy was a theoretical mathematician. Shouldn't have been there. Uh, shouldn't have been there. Right? Shouldn't have he been actually there. had a, I don't know if he had his doctorate degree, but he had a higher degree. And uh, he really inspired me um, to ask tough questions and to go after the hard stuff science and really um he was a physics teacher right um so it was a physics teacher that really got me excited about science um in this small town um so it kind of came out of nowhere um and i don't know if you remember um but uh, when i was young um i battled cancer um mm -hmm. i was diagnosed with leukemia um and spent second and third grade basically in the hospital um i relapsed um with the same cancer and then i ended up getting a core blood stem cell transplant. Um, so I was the first six out of six antigen match for the core blood stem cell transplant um, in the world. Um, wow. So it was a really novel um, process at the time. A lot of people weren't surviving. I went to Duke University to get this transplant. And through that whole process, um, I was lucky enough to survive it. But I came out the other end of that really inspired about what goes in um, to the science to, to help treat people with disease. And um, coming out the other end of that, um, I, I wanted to give back, right? I mean, I watched people pour their days and lives into saving my life. And I was like, I want to get in. I want to do that, right? So it was a little bit of that spark in high school um, combined with that sort of childhood um, battle with cancer that kind of led me into the sciences and biology. Um, so that's sort of how I got my motivation and passion. I'm off the ground. Yeah, man. I, I remember the only thing I remember from from being that young is when I first moved to to the town. I think it was in third grade, and I I just remember the whole town was just yeah. so stoked and just like the, the the energy from you beating that was just so I don't know. I can't. That's the only thing I can remember was just that feeling of triumph, like. Everybody felt like they won too. Like it was, uh, it was, 
the huge part of me getting through that whole thing was being in a small town like Cherryville where, you know, everybody cares really about everybody. Um, and, you know, I had a tremendous amount of support from that town. Uh, and that's what they raised money, um, constantly coming to visit, sending motivational calls. I mean, the whole nine yards across the board, that was a big part of it of me getting through that process. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, that's that, really what inspired me to pursue a career in science. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so what were you like in high school? <laughs> well, I was kind of like all over the place, man. I played some sports. I marched snare drum in the band. Um, I had blonde tips and 16-gauge earrings. I thought I was a backstreet boy. Um, We're not, hey, let's not, let's not. Get on the block. <laughs> you don't have to go that deep because that, then you're just going to make me talk about my time and not, we're not going to do that. I played in this awesome rock band called Fat Bird. Um, I was a drummer and I believe you were the lead singer. Um, no, it was good times, man. It was good. Uh, you know, I studied hard. I studied hard, but I also partied hard. You know, I, I had a healthy balance of both. Um, but my goals were always, to, uh, you know, grind it out in the classroom, you know, and even though I had a good time in high school, um, I finished valedictorian. So, you know, part of that is my mom was like, you know, if you keep straight A's, um, I'm going to, you know, take the, you know, I'm not going to have a strict curfew for you. You know, I'm not going to be too hard on you as, as long as you keep the grades up. So that, that gave me the freedom um, to, to kind of, you know, have fun a little bit, but it was always, you know, dependent on how, how well I did in school. Right. And to me, I was self-motivated, so it wasn't very hard. So speaking of uh, our teacher, Corbin West, and I know he, he actually, you know, started getting me more into sciences. So talk about like what, what aspect of a teacher can really play that pivotal role in a student's life to really light, light the spark. Like what was it for you? Like what science, was it chemistry that he taught or physics? Which one actually was like, okay, all right, it's on. Yeah, uh, it was physics that really he was his, where I took his course. And I think Curtis was in there with me, Travis. It was a, a fun class. What, what he did, and I think what people who are really good at mentoring and teaching can do, is they, they stay excited about the topic, right? So, so many times um, throughout my career um, as a student, which has been a long one, you get professors that are really good and they're excited about what they're talking about. Um, that excitement is contagious, right? You can feel it, you can feed off of that. And Corbin was, he was always excited about the physics problems. And he always helped us come to it in really um, creative ways, right? So like physics, you know, you have formulas and you're trying to find the values that plug into those formulas. And he taught us how to really go after that and kept it fun and kept it exciting. I think that that's the main thing, right? He wasn't, we weren't just doing problems in a book. Um, he had ways of, you know, inspiring us with problem sets, but also making it interactive, right? So we can all contribute to the class. And we all felt like, and he was, he did a really good job of um, creating a really inclusive sort of classroom where um, he would, you know, get people involved that really wouldn't say much or talk much or sit in the back. You know, he would pull those people out and be, hey, why don't you, let's, let's work together in groups, let's do these different things. So from his teaching strategies to his, his excitement, um, I think both of those things were, for me, um, sort of helped me get excited about physics. Um, and I think it got everybody else excited about physics. And, you know, and as I've gone on in my career, and I have, if I can think about my favorite college professors, they were always the ones that um, got excited about it right? That got up in the classroom and act crazy. They may stand on a desk, yep. right? You have these lessons that you just don't, you, you'll never forget because of those classroom moments. Um, so I think Corb, he, he kind of exemplified that, um, you know, and I don't think he, he set out to be a teacher. He just had this natural sort of ability to, um, to, to make whatever he's doing exciting. And I think that's, that's, you know, you can get students there. If you're excited, they can get excited. About yeah. It. I mean, I can't stress this enough, guys. Like, this, he was a very intelligent person who just happened to stumble into teaching high school. Had no business, really. He could have been doing pretty much, I'm guessing, anything he wanted to do, yeah. and uh, and yet he was he was in there with us and and making it fun. I mean, he was definitely one of one of the people I would you know considered to be an influence on me in high school and. 
Um, shout out to Corbin West. Like, That's if we ever say anybody knows him or you see him, then you know, yeah, yeah shout out to him. I think Travis and Curtis and everybody else in that classroom would uh, feel the exact same way. Yep, yep. All right, so where did you do your undergrad? Appalachian State University. So we got we got two on here, yeah. at least that have been yeah. to App. So I applied to I think Duke. Carolina, Appalachian State, NC State, uh, and I think that was it. And I got into Carolina. I got into Carolina and Appalachian State were my two that I was kind of narrowing it down to. And um, I ended up getting um, the Chancellor Scholarship at Appalachian State, which pays full ride for four years, um, versus going to Carolina, where I would have had to probably come up with half the tuition. So for me, um, you know, my family hadn't saved up you know, mega bucks to cover any college call. Actually, they had saved up zero dollars. Um, so for me, I took Appalachian State um, because uh, I was going to go there for free. I didn't have to work, you know, and I could concentrate on my studies. So it was a no brainer for me. Um, plus, I'm sort of more of a mountain person, you know, so I, I like the, the atmosphere up there, too. So it sort of ended up sending me uh, up the mountain to Appalachian State. Um, university um, where I stayed in the honors dorms because I was a chancellor scholar it was really was a nice nice um, nice choice that I made um, that's, that's that awesome life. so what were um, what were some key classes or things that that really helped push you along or teachers or, or anything and in, in, at Appalachian yeah absolutely so you know this is where reality kind of set in as I'm sitting in that freshman biology classroom day one right and you know, as well as I do, we didn't have a tremendous amount of science classes. Um, I barely even looked through a microscope coming up through Cher Cherryville school system. Um, we just didn't have a lot of science, no AP science classes. When we were there now, I think they have that stuff. But when we were there, we didn't have a lot. So I'm sitting in there the first day and um, the professor's like, we're gonna have a, a practical in three weeks. I didn't even know what a practical was. And they had all these people around me talking about going to medical school and how they're going to ace the practical. I was like, I don't even know what practical is. Right. So for me, I was like, I felt like imposter syndrome, you know, like I'm here, I'm a chancellor scholar, but I feel so much, you know, more stupid, stupider than everybody else in this room. Uh, and in that classroom, it was in uh, the professor in that concepts of biology was Gary Walker, Dr. Gary Walker. And, you know, I asked a couple questions in class and I don't know whether he knew that I was, a, you know, needed a little extra mentoring or if that's sort of the way that he does. And I think that he's just a really good professor. Um, he, he would, you know, pull me aside, ask me questions. And, you know, I just led to a good relationship. I'd go to his office, talk to him, um, and it just helped. You know, I think I needed that little extra one on one contact um, that I don't think I would have gotten at Carolina at a bigger school when you're like several hundred and that classroom at Appalachian State in this intro class I was like 50 you know I think even in that class there was like 30 to 50 at the time so it was like a smaller number so he, he, the professors knew your name uh, and it gave me some contact with him and it helped kind of like build my confidence uh, and then once I got into like you know a little bit upper level sciences um, where I really fell in love with the science and this is important I think for people um, tuning into your show is I set out to go uh, pre-med. I was all the way medical doctor. Um, and I became involved in the pre-medical health club. Um, it's a club where we bring in physicians, dentists, PAs, all these people that are in the health professions industry. And we let them talk about their experiences. And the, I, we shadow physicians and stuff. The more I did this, the more I realized that I didn't want to be a doctor, um, you know, in the sense of a medical doctor, because I didn't want to work those weird hours. I didn't want to, I didn't want the monotony of uh, general practice or family practice. I didn't want the stress of going in there and telling somebody's family that, you know, their child's not going to, there's a lot of stuff that you learn by talking to these people. Uh, and I figured out that it just wasn't for me. I don't like hospitals. You know, I didn't think about it when I was going in. I don't want to be in one. I was in one for so long when I was a child, I just, to me, the smell of it just bothered me. So, you know, you, you don't think about it until you actually start having these conversations with these professionals. So I figured out my junior year that I didn't want to be an MD. 
Um, so that's when another professor stepped into my life. It was really important to me. And that was uh, Dr. Ted Zaruka, who's um, still currently at Appalachian State. And he does zebrafish research and looks at conservation of genes from fish to humans and how those things have changed. It was really cool. It was exciting. And he, he gave me the opportunity to come into his lab. And I took a course that he taught. And it was about developmental biology. And once I started studying developmental biology, it was over um, for me. I wanted to be, I wanted to do research in the developmental biology field because the whole field studies how one cell develops into tissues and organ structures and all the things that go in to building those structures uh, mechanistically. So for me, I was hook, line, and sinker sold. And he took me in um, underneath this arms and and gave me an opportunity to do research in his lab as a master's student. So after Appalachian State undergrad, I transitioned into the master's program there in cell molecular biology, and I worked with Ted Zaruka, um, one of the, you know, the greatest mentors. Uh, and then from there on, um, it was all, all she wrote. You know, I took off. I started getting my confidence at the bench and doing the science, talking in front of people, telling people about the science. Um, and Ted was a great mentor across the board in helping me become sort of a nice, young, um, critically thinking scientist. Um, so, you know, it was a, a combination of a couple professors and a couple courses. And really, for me, it was helping me build my confidence. Uh, and, you know, it was good mentoring kind of did that for me, you know, um, by taking me in, giving me a little bit of extra sort of, you know, opportunities to, to get into the lab and get my hands wet with doing some research. And, and that sort of um, projected me uh, on the path that I'm on today. So let's, let's actually talk about that. Cause I don't think anybody really takes in consideration the amount of public speaking skills that, that you need in, in this, in the field of science or any, 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 uh, uh, thing related to science that you have to, cause a lot of the times you're kind of pitching, you're almost set, like selling your idea to yes. others. Right. So like, did you take any public speaking classes, mass communication, like what, something like that? To no. Help? So, um, throughout the curriculum, and I think this is probably true at most colleges now you have these like speaking designators so each person with their major is required to get a, probably a certain amount of these um, if they have a speaking designator that means there's something embedded in the course that requires you to get up in front of people and, and talk about you know a project or presentation or something like that I had no formal public speaking but I think your point is an absolutely fantastic one nobody told me when I was sitting in there as a junior on my way to start doing research that um, if you think about what a science, a research scientist is, you think about this kind of nerd in a lab coat um, in a lab with pipettes and beakers and microscopes. Um, that is the furthest thing from the truth that, that there is because um, to be successful at my level, um, I spend most of my time writing manuscripts. So you have to be a great writer. Um, I have, I travel around the world telling people and selling people on my science. So you got to be a fantastic public speaker. You need to be outgoing because part of being successful as a scientist is forming collaborations with other people. So, you know, it is the complete opposite of this introverted scientist image that I think we have. Um, and and, and the, the scientists in today's world that are very successful are those that can get out and can tell a story and can write and, and, and can write grants to get their, their, you know, their research funded. Um, they can talk to other colleagues, talk about ideas, right? So the more outgoing you are and the more contact you have with other people, um, your product gets better, right? Because the more scientists I get thinking about my research and they give me feedback, I take that feedback to heart and my end product is better. So when I'm sitting there as a junior at Appalachian State, I'm thinking, oh, I'm just gonna do research, right? Well, to be a professor and to go on the academic track, it requires not only do you have good scientific research skills, but you better have all the other intangibles too to be successful. And that includes exactly like you said, public speaking, grant writing. And I've done stuff along the way. Um, and a part of that's my mentors that I've had that have been really good at kind of um, helping me develop those skills, right? They forced me to go speak at uncomfortable meetings and uncomfortable group sessions. They forced me to write my first manuscript. 
right? And sat there and edited and bled it to death with ink, you know? So I've developed those things along the way um, because you have to. Um, and I was unaware that I was going to have to do all that when I started this path. Um, so you've got to be really a jack of all trades, um, and a master of the science. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's really interesting. And I think, you know, it's not just science. There's a lot of other occupations that you don't, you don't, you wouldn't think in because of film and, and, and exactly. TV and stuff that give you a, a paint a picture of this certain occupation. It turns out it's the farthest thing that you, from the truth yeah, that it's, it's actually yeah. is. Um, so we're, we're going to circle back around to what you were saying, uh, earlier about being the first in your family to go to college and, uh, talk about some of the major obstacles you had to overcome during your, um, your undergrad and your, and your getting your master's. Yeah. So, you know, if you don't have anybody that's in your family, that's really been to college, you don't know what to expect, right? You haven't heard the stories, um, about, you know, how to study, how to balance, um, you know, your freedom with your, um, with your studies. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it was for me was just sort of no mental preparation, right. Um, that you kind of would get if you're, you know, if your family, both your parents had, had, you know, been in the university, like my girls right now, I bring them in and they're at a university, you know, all the time. So they're going to grow up in the complete opposite situation than I did. So they're going to be comfortable with the, the vastness of it, you know, all the people, um, the labs and stuff. So for me, it was like culture shock walking into that. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it for you, but for me, like we were pretty conservative uh, little town, right? Um, and I really hadn't had my eyes open to a really a view of what the world is really like. Um, so I think for me, um, for people who come from families who have been to college, you know, they've experienced, they have more worldly culturing experience. And we just didn't have that. I didn't get that until my first two years of, as an undergraduate. Right. So for, for me, it was kind of, you know, to hear all the, the, the stories coming from the, the, the liberal arts classes and, and sociology, you know, and how we work as a society, um, different cultural um, things that you just don't think of about right um so for me um, i think that that's probably the biggest part was i was just naive to really how the world works um and, and i think that you know maybe other people kind of you know get that subconsciously by being in a household where people have been you know have higher education degrees um so for me that was the biggest thing was to kind of step back and go hey wait a minute you know that's not what i believe but is that what i believe or is that just what i've always been told right so really it was kind of, you know, spreading out and finding my own space to grow intellectually and to, and to be open-minded, right? Um, and that was, for me, the hardest part of transitioning in as a kind of a, a first-generation college student from a very small town. Um, so um, it takes a little bit more time for you to kind of open your mind and, and, and start to really absorb. Yeah, that's the truth. And, and, you know, that's one of the reasons I started this whole thing is because if you think about it, I mean, those small town conservative towns are more of the norm than than a lot of people think. And so, you know, you think, oh, well, it was just me I, I, I mean, I coming into this situation. Like there's tons of people that I've met who, who are going through the same thing that that really have to. And it's such a shock in a way, like when you look back at like going from that the safe, you know, small town into the larger worlds. I remember when when I first went to China on that, on that plane trip and landed on my own, like in, in this whole different world, it almost felt like the time I went to college. It really did. It was like, this is, this is whole, all new experience. This is, it's so much bigger than me, you know? And, uh, um, I think you feel like you have a bigger role when you're in a smaller town. So when it, when that gets kind of diminished, it really forces you to think about your place in the world. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I agree, man. Totally. Um, so tell us about the process uh, you had to go through to get your PhD. All right. So um, when I came out of Appalachian State with my bachelor of science degree. Um, I had dabbed in research a little bit, but um, to be competitive for a 
doctoral program in the biological sciences, you have got to have a substantial independent research experience um, these days um, to be competitive for your Harvard's, your Dukes, your Michigan's, your big powerhouses. You've got to either come from a big lab or you've got to show somehow that you've got the rigor of science and you show that by um, publications and um, the work that you do um, when you're an undergraduate. Um, I didn't have that. So for me, my back was against the wall trying to get into a big program. So that's why I, one of the reasons why I stuck around and got a master's. So I needed to get the res more research experience to be competitive for the, for the doctoral level. Now, if I would have went to Carolina, um, I probably would have gotten to a lab early on in a big person's lab and probably could have had a little bit easier streamlined process into the PhD because there's more resources. There's more labs where you can get in and get that experience at Appalachian State. Um, now it's different there, but when I was there, it was mostly ecology focused. They were just starting to get the people in that were doing the cell developmental molecular biology stuff. So there wasn't a tremendous amount of opportunity to get that independent research experience. What I mean by that is experience at the bench doing research outside of class. So you go in on your own time and you work with a professor. Usually you, you, you get like credit for it for um, um, independent study um, and you write an honors thesis or something like that. Um, so I didn't get a tremendous amount of that as a, as a, you know, undergraduate, but in my master's is where I started building up that research experience. And when I came out of my master's um, at Appalachian State, that's when I was competitive, and that's when I started applying. And I applied to Harvard, I applied to uh, Duke, Carolina, Michigan, Vanderbilt. Um, I actually still got the rejection letter from Harvard. Um, they they waited forever to reject me because I think I was on the waiting list. But uh, I got into Duke in Michigan. And the process was you apply, you write a personal statement, uh, and then, you know, you take, I think at, at that time you take the GRE. Now, I don't even know if you have to take the GRE, at least for Michigan now, you don't. I think you can take another test or you don't have to take it at all. It's based off of recommendation letters and your personal statements and stuff. Um, so once you get an invite for an interview, they fly you up there, all expense paid, and you interview with you know, the scientists that you'll be working with in the program. And at that point in time, whenever you get that invitation to come up there for the interview, um, typically you've, you're in a good spot. They're trying to recruit, recruit you at that point. Um, so, you know, both Duke and Michigan were trying to recruit me at that point, And I chose to go to Michigan. Um, gut feeling, man, you know, like I weighed everything. I liked the, the environment at Michigan was like, it's progressive. Um, it felt more um, like I had a family up there, the, the people, there was going to be better mentoring, professional development. And also, um, I knew I wanted to be in North Carolina at the end of the day and in, in 10 years from now. And in this field, um, it's important that you show that you've gone out of your comfort zone. Um, you, like if you do your undergraduate, your master's or your PhD, your postdoc, everything in the same state, it looks, you know, it, it shows that you haven't really gone out and, and challenged yourself demographically, right? So it, it, it looks really good if you go from one place to another, right? So it's it, to go out and then come back. Um, so that was another part of the reason why I went to Michigan. Um, um, Heather, my uh, wife now, fiance at the time, um, she had family up there, so it was a nice transition up there where she would get to hang out with some of her family, her, her grandmother and aunt. Um, so we, you know, you, when you have that decision, I you just write down the pros and cons. And, you know, I kept finding ways, uh, trying to find reasons not to go to Michigan, you know, and it was like, why am I doing this? Obviously, it's a no-brainer, so I ended up going to Michigan, and uh, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, I transitioned in to... Uh, Ben Allen's lab, um, where I studied um, hedgehog signaling, which is this development signal pathway that's involved in building all of the organs in your body. Um, it's fascinating. Um, and he really, Dr. Benjamin Allen at Michigan was one of the best mentors that I've ever um, come in contact with. And I was lucky um, to work with him for, for the five and a half years up there. And it's a long process getting your PhD. So, um, 
five and a half years, I think is, you know, it's five to seven years is the average now, right? Five wow. and a half is probably pretty good. Um, so you take classes, you do your research, um, you write grants. Um, so the bar is high once you step foot that first day in the door in your graduate program. The first two years are time intensive. You're rotating. You're trying to find a lab to work in. What you do is you start, and, and this is pretty much the same at many of these biomedical programs, is you rotate through. It's sort of like speed dating, but you're speed dating for a semester with a lab. And then you have to rotate to another lab and you stay in there and you try to find your fit, right? What lab you're going to be working in. And then that's the lab you kind of settle in um, to develop your project and write your dissertation on. Um, and it's a journey, man. It's tough. It's a long road. Um, <laughs> there's dark days where the experiments aren't working. You're grinding. You're working 12 hour days. Uh, you have to love it um, to stay in this track. Um, for, um, for the, to go the whole, all the way to academic professor. Um, I love biology. Um, I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about mentoring all along the way. I've had students and at Michigan, I really learned um, how to become a good scientist and how to become a good mentor um, underneath of Ben Allen. But, you know, those five and a half years, um, it's tough. Um, the metaphor that um, somebody said that I still love today, I can't remember who said it, but the PhD in science is like going in, you're a train going into a tunnel, right? There's light at first, you get into the tunnel, all of a sudden it's dark. That's like year three, year three and a half for your project. You're trying to get your dissertation together. You're trying to get your paper. You don't know if there's any end. You've given up all hope. And all of a sudden you see the light at the end of the tunnel and you come out and all is well. And I think that's the journey. That's the realistic view of what the journey is like. It's not easy. Um, if it's easy, uh, something's not right. <laughs> you know so you expect it to be difficult and it is and you'll fail um you will fail over and over and over again but what makes you a successful person at the end of that is how you get back up after those long days of failed experiments how do you get back up and get to the bench the next day and start again the rigor you build the rigor you don't take things personal man you know if people tell you that your science is crap um you know usually they don't say crap hopefully they give you some reason why they think it's crap right? Take that in. Like, you know what? That's right. All right. I'm going to make the next product better, right? Which means I may need to do a couple different sets of experiment. Um, so, you know, that's how the PhD process sort of, it's long, it's hard, but it teaches you how to become a great scientist. Um, and it's not easy, but if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? I guess. So that's, that's why it's, it's a tough journey and you got to have the passion because if the passion is not there, it's easy to just, you know, just go out, right? um to to hit the door but if you love it um there you know you'll stay with it and it's it's a rewarding experience so i wonder if it's kind of like me with the audio stuff or programming like when you love something is it a time sink can you just go into a lab and be like next thing you look up it's been like four or five hours you're like what just happened absolutely absolutely i mean it depends on what you're doing man you can go down rabbit holes doing different things uh you got to learn how to manage your time but you know if you love it you love i love being in the lab you know i love talking science i love talking with undergraduates and graduate students and getting on the whiteboard right here and drawing out what's happening inside of a cell you know um i just love that you know so i like being in the environment and you know i may not get anything done for three hours but you know i will be talking science and we'll be you know not getting anything done physically with my product but like you know or my research project but you know talking about the science out loud which in the end of the day that's how we make progress right so by talking about ideas mm -hmm. and bouncing it off you know i'm not the smartest person in the room um very rarely but you know i like to talk about things i have ideas and once you get a couple people talking about ideas you, and those ideas get even better and they get structured. And the next thing you know, you have a new direction for your project that may be groundbreaking. Uh, so to me, like every day I get up, I come into work and every day could be one of those days where we have that conversation that changes the way we think about science. Um, it changes the way the public, um, you know, perceive science. It changes the way that medicine, um, changes the way that we treat patients that are suffering from the diseases that we study so for me that rush um keeps me going and um you know you can get excited and you can have days where you just kind of get lost in it man uh, for sure 
Um, so similar to what you're talking about with the technology and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so what, what was the biggest hurdle for you in that dark tunnel that you had to make your way through? Oh, let's see. So <laughs> I, I, there was a lot of dark times. Uh, you know, I spent, uh, I spent a whole year on a project that was fascinating. Um, and I kept getting really cool results, but it wasn't enough to really nail home what was actually happening. Um, so I kept doing, I mean, a year and a half, my first year and a half. And we just could not, every time I do experiment, I do another one that kind of contradicted the first one, right? And we were doing, you know, the right controls, everything was, we were repeating it. So, you know, it just, after a year and a half, I had to hang this project up. You know, I was like, I'm a year and a half in my PhD. The project that I thought was going to be amazing is, is we're basically at a stalemate, right? We have no next step to go. We've exhausted every resource. Um, and it was tough. At that point in time, I was like, you know what? Maybe I just don't have what it takes. You know, maybe it's me, right? Um, that's the problem. Um, so that's where you're in the part of the tunnel where it's, that light from behind is getting pretty dark. Uh, so it's that point in time where you, you know, and I don't, it wasn't just me. What was, what helped me through this was having 15 other peers that were sort of in similar situations. Now, not everybody had the same situation, but just, we, we talk, we, we, you know, talk together and, you know, figured, you know, you, when I say misery loves company, but it's like, you know, like we were there together, just grinding it out and we would vent to each other. Uh, and we come up with ideas and, you know, together, me and my ball sort of pivoted. We, we used sort of some of what we had and went into a new direction. And the new direction started opening up really interesting findings. Uh, and that's sort of how I got out of it, right? That project pivoted into a different project and it ended up um, helping me discover a really interesting thing. So um, at the end of the day, it ended up being a beautiful story, um, despite wasting the first year and a half. Um, so for me, before we made that transition, and really it was just doing the experiments, getting back to work, getting back in there. What is interest? We, if we lay everything out, where's the next direction in this? And we tried a different things and a couple things started working, you know, and then that's all she wrote, you know? So it's, uh, that was probably the, the darkest time. Um, and I don't think that that's, you know, a rare occurrence. I think that that's pretty hits the yeah. metaphor right so it's like it it's that how you overcome that um you know kind of dictates how you're going to be in the future right because a lot of students they'll drop out after two and a half years when they experience failure um so can you experience that failure and then you know overcome it and i think that that's the biggest that's the hardest part of the journey is when you have more responsibility for the research project as a doctoral student um, and, and you, and you run into failure. And for me, it was a, you know, a year and a half in, you know, I'm like, oh, is, do I have what it takes, man? You know, and, it, and, and, you know, it just took good mentoring from my boss, um, good family support, you know, and good friends. Um, and that got me through it, you know, just to get back up, to shake things off and to get back to the bench and just find the next direction. And we did, you know, and, and you always will, um, but you've got to, you know, it's hard, right, to get over that failure and to get back up and to get going. Um, so it, it's uh, that's definitely probably the hardest time. Yeah, and, and I've heard that from, you know, almost every successful person that I've talked to is it's it's the art of the pivot. It's yeah. when you have you think you have a great idea and you just start and you just have to start running with it. And then when you hit a wall, it's your ability to turn, like take what you've done and pivot it into something else, not losing everything, but just building on it in a slightly different direction. And Absolutely. so many people I've heard in, in media and, and math, science, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter that that's, that's the basis of every successful person, which has been really fascinating to hear um, yep. and really motivating for myself and hopefully for everybody listening. Um, but that, that's awesome. All right. So let's move on. Um, what, um, uh, well, first, what was your thesis in, by the way? Uh, my doctoral thesis? Yeah. 
I studied um, each one of our, most of our cells have these um, cellular antennas um, called primary cilium. And I was studying how proteins move up and down the cilium. So I was studying how proteins move inside of a cell. And the proteins that I were studying were um, transcription factors, um, which bind DNA, um, and they were members of the hedgehog signaling pathway. And this pathway is critical in building all your tissues. Um, but if you go inside of the cell and you look at these proteins, why they're traveling up this antenna, um, it was a mystery. This is a subcellular organelle that sticks out of our cells um, that we really didn't understand its importance until, you know, probably two decades ago when all these human patients started coming up with these diseases called ciliopathies and they were deficient in these cellular antennas. So this did, their cells didn't make the antennas and this pathway was affected. So we figured out that those antennas were important for this pathway. So these proteins must be going up inside and coming down for a reason. So I studied how these motors that walk along microtubules, and they actually look like legs. I studied how they carry these proteins along these microtubules up and down the antenna. And I was trying to tease out how these things bind to one another and how they traffic to different parts of the cell. So it was really a, a combination of a lot of um, cellular work, um, microscopy, looking at how these proteins that we can fluorescently tag how they move to different parts of the cell. And if I knock out a region of a protein that's important in binding this protein and it can no longer bind, that's helping it walk along these microtubules, what happens to its distribution in the cell, right? If it can no longer bind to the thing that's carrying it, um, it doesn't get where it needs to go. Now, how does that now affect the organism? So through all this, we try to tease out how these transcription factors were interacting with these motors that traffic up and down the cilium. And what I found was that there were some critical binding sites that mediated this interaction. And if you knock those binding sites out and you prevented the motor, which would be the legs, from interacting with the protein, you saw debilitating defects in the trafficking and the function of those proteins. So I did this in mouse, um, in chick, and uh, mammalian cells. Um, three different systems I worked on to ask these questions, um, and it was really an interesting project. Um, I would electroporate deficient constructs, so if it would be a motor that couldn't bind to this um, protein, into the chick nervous system. So I would get eggs from a chicken farm on Mondays. I would cut a hole in the top of the chicken egg, and I would with a microscopic needle, I would inject in and overexpress certain constructs or knock things down, or you could overexpress constructs that had mutations in these binding sites. And then I would let the chicken develop and I would harvest it and section it and stain for neural tube patterning. So I looked at nervous system patterning in chick, uh, in the chick uh, uh, spinal cord. So, and that's how we, that was our readout for function. So it was a, it was a three system model, three model system um, approach to understanding how these motors affect these transcription factors. So it was a very complicated um, mixture of developmental biology and cell biology. So was, um, so really, was there timing issues for the pathways? Like, is that one of the reasons that? Yeah, so when you prevented the motors from interacting with these proteins, these proteins couldn't traffic up and down this cellular antenna. And what we found is like something's in the antenna that's important for making these things active. And if it doesn't go up and down the antenna, and we still don't know the answer to what's up there. I just showed that if it can't get up there, it doesn't work. Um, so we don't know. It, it could be that it, at the top of the antenna, these proteins receive some sort of modifications that change it, that go from one state to an activated state. And once it's activated and it leaves the antenna, then it can go down into the nucleus, bind DNA, and start turning on genes. Hmm. Um, but we know that if it can't traffic in there, um, that it doesn't do that job properly. So, and, and what our readout for, for that was, was neural patterning in the chick. So hedgehog signaling, um, is involved in heart development, um, brain development, 
uh, muscle, gut, everything. And we just use the chick nervous system as a readout for how, if you could perturb these interactions and keep it from going to the antenna, how does that now affect, you know, motor neurons from forming? Um, and what we saw was when we perturbed those interactions, we saw all kinds of different phenotypes in the nervous system. So you would have a loss of a cell type, you'd have uh, too many motor neurons. Um, so what this means when we study this stuff, we mechanistically tease this stuff out. So it, once I found these domains, those could be drug targets, right? You could send, you could, you could have drugs that will maybe help repair that interaction or if the interaction's bad, it can help perturb that interaction. So by doing the research I did, we found sequences that you could actually send in therapeutics or antibodies or something to target those sequences to fix the problem. Um, so what we know is that humans that suffer from mutations in cilia and mutations in these proteins have a range of debilitating defects um, in cancer. So by studying this at the cellular level, we can start to understand how these pathways work in the, at the level of the cell and movement inside of the cell. And if we can then start fixing those problems at the level of the cell, then we can hopefully fix the disease. Um, that's the idea for why we study these kind of stripped down basic model systems. That's fascinating. Um, would, that, would that science also be used for um, possibly like 3D printing organs as well? So we haven't done any 3D um, printing um, organs and stuff like that, but, but they can be, you can be, you can use um, 3D printing Graphing. to uh, to help. And once you, once you figure mm -hmm. out um, me mechanistically what's wrong, it can give you insights into um, what's happening at the tissue level. Um, and once you start understanding what's happening at the tissue level, you can understand how you get different shapes um, of different tissues, because a lot of these pathways are involved in patterning. Um, patterning your digits, right? Patterning different um, organs, pa patterning your ribs, right? So it's like there's all these things that um, these signaling pathways, um, which are just proteins that are inside of cells that work together to do to turn on certain genes. And there's difference, there's differences in these pathways, but each of these pathways um, help build different things as you're developing. Um, so 3D printing, once you figure out how these things are built, um, you know, you can use 3D printing to actually build those structures, right? But when you have the structures, what the mechanism does, it tells you how you go from one cell to building those big structures. But for humans um, and medicine, you can use 3D structures or 3D printing to print valves in the heart, um, you know, all kinds of different things, ligaments and stuff. Wow. Now, um, I think, you know, moving forward with that technology is going to have a lot more um, success moving forward. I think now it's kind of new, but it's still being used and it's probably increases its use um, every day. Awesome. Well, since I have you on a roll, go ahead and uh, tell us what kind of research you're doing now and what are your goals and aspirations for the future? Yeah. So in my doctoral work, I did developmental biology, right? So studying how we go from one cell to a full-blown organism with all these tissues uh, living and thriving. Um, I wanted to stay with the theme of developmental biology, so I wanted to study a basic system that shares a lot of the developmental similarities that we do. So I switched to microscopic worms that grow on crap to do my research. They're called C. elegans. They're a nematode. They're super cool, man. They share 45% of our genome. And what I switched to from hedgehog signaling, so signaling pathways and development, I switched to epigenetics. So epigenetics means above the gene. So each of us have genes, right? Um, my twins, they're identical twins. They have the same genes. So their code ATGC is the same in one, ATGC in the other. Um, there's no differences, yet they are very different. One of them is a different shoe size. One of them acts completely different. Um, the shapes of their face are different. So what causes those changes if the genes are the same? Well, those genes have to be packaged inside of cells, right? And every time a cell divides, um, you know, genes have got to be turned on and turned off. And what this, what epigenetics means is these genes um, are packaged into the nucleus by other proteins coming and help package it. You think of a, a set of hands that helps wrap a gene up. 
right? Those hands would be what would be considered epigenetics. And those hands would be proteins. Different proteins come in and they wrap that DNA up to help package it tightly in cells. So if you have mutations in those things that wrap the DNA up, the DNA stays unwound. Well, genes are inside of the DNA, right? In order to turn a gene on, you've got to unwrap DNA. If you want to really shut down a gene, you have to wrap it back up. And this is constantly happening as you go from different cell types. Um, what's happening in the nucleus is these proteins unwrap DNA so you can get to that spot and transcribe that gene that needs to be transcribed. If it's a muscle cell, you have to unwrap that muscle gene so that you can get the machinery in there to turn that gene on, right? So these proteins are what is considered epigenetics, the proteins that interact with DNA to help package it. And they can have a significant impact on the expression of genes just by not allowing things to access it, right? And what I study is how these proteins that help package DNA along with the DNA are inherited from one generation to the next. The worms that I study, um, they lay 300 progeny every four days. So I can study 10 generations in 40 days. So these proteins that help wind DNA up, these things can be affected by your environment. So the food you eat, stress, experiences in your life can change these proteins. So they may not work as good. Right. So you could be exposed to some sort of chemical that affects one of these proteins. And now you don't package DNA as much. Right. Maybe one of my twins that have the same genes. One of their proteins in this packaging gets a little messed up or they're not expect They're not expressing now um, as much of the gene as the other twin. Right. Well, that differences in gene expression can cause phenotype changes like overdevelopment of a tissue or excess cell growth. Um, and lead to disease, or it can lead to different phenotypes or difference in height. Um, so basically what I study is how DNA is packaged, all the proteins that interact that package DNA that are infected by the environment that also can be passed down from one generation to the next. So what I concentrate on are how do you go from a sperm and an egg, now with all these open chromatin, open genes at sperm and egg, to make a totipotent zygote now that can become everything. Think about it. An oocyte, an egg, and a sperm are highly specialized cells. They have to fuse together and become one cell that can now become every cell in the body, right? So how do you go from a sperm and an egg now to a totipotent zygote, right? Well, you've got to close down genes that aren't, don't need to be turned on, right? So at all these thousands of sperm genes, you have to go in and these proteins wrap that DNA up really tight. You also have to open up genes that are going to be required for that one cell now to become two cells, right? So I study how that whole process is orchestrated between, between generations. It's really complicated, and it involves with all these things that basically interact with the DNA to either open it up or close it down. Um, and in different parts, so you think about it, if you're going on your journey as a muscle cell and a muscle tissue – you want to keep nerve genes off, right? You want to keep sperm genes off. So those things are bound really tight and they're wrapped up really tight. But for muscle genes, you want to unwrap it, right? So that you can have access and turn those genes on. And this one muscle cell can then become two muscle cells and you keep those things open. Um, but you don't want open chromatin at genes that are associated with other tissues. So there's all these proteins that help open up genes at the right time in the right place and shut down genes at the right time in the right place. And it's really complicated, and we're trying to tease out the mechanisms because if you think about human disease, a lot of that is based off of mutations in the genes. But there's a lot of human disease that can be explained by mutations in those genes. And what we're starting to understand is you're having defects in these things that are regulating accessibility, and you're getting massive changes in the gene expression levels without having changes in the sequence at all. And think about it, if you're expressing 10 times more of a protein that's involved in cell cycle or making cells divide faster, that's cancer, right? So like we're starting to appreciate now how this packaging and opening and chroming is critical for understanding human disease. And this is something that we've just really started thinking about within the last couple of decades uh, of this epigenetic, this influence of all these proteins on the DNA, as opposed to just the DNA itself. Um,
Yeah, and how the process is regulated, right? So we know we know some of the machinery that helps open and helps close, but how those things work together um, as you go from two sales to four sales to eight sales to now specifying gut versus specifying muscle versus specifying neurons. We don't understand how all these things work together to get this tight control of different cell types. So we're trying to build now this, what changes as you shift programs, um, right? And we're trying to understand, does this one protein interact with this protein? And are they, you know, the things that close down are not the same things that open up, right? So how do they, are they present at the same locations? And how do some genes stay open and some stay closed? And we're really trying to tease all that out right now. Yeah, Sorry, guys, I'm muted my mic. I basically just asked him, like, if it was what was triggering the opening and closing the mechanism. Um, so that's what he was explaining. Um, yeah. All right. So let's move on. So what the, what's the future plans that you have? Future plans are to, to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I, uh, I take this system into the undergraduate labs. Um, I led a lot of the undergraduate students. Um, I also um, am adjunct faculty at Oglethorpe University and worked at Morehouse University as well. And at Oglethorpe University, um, we bring the worms in and they actually do authentic research over there. So they do a lot of the experiments that are related to my project. Um, so it's a simple system and I wanna stay with that system where I can use it um, to bring my own research into the classroom. Um, for me, that's what gets me the most excited. And students get excited because they're doing groundbreaking work. Um, on the manuscript that I'm getting ready to publish, um, one of the major experiments towards the end of the paper is an experiment that came out of a class that I taught last semester where a student said, Dr. C, um, doesn't your model depend on this protein um, as well? And I was like, that's a great insight, right? Why don't you do the experiment and you tell me? So I, we worked together. We came up with an idea how to do the experiment and it come out, come to find out it supported our model really nice. We had thought about that experiment, but this undergraduate in my course, he came up with that um, independently. Um, and you can see how inspired they get when they're able to study the stuff. You're teaching it to them, but you're teaching them your stuff, right? So I'm not, I'm not teaching them out of a textbook. Um, in fact, I don't use a textbook at all. I just use primary literature, the hottest new stuff and the new reviews that are out to help teach the course. So they're on the edge and they're doing the exciting research that's getting published. Um, and when they see that, they own it, man. They get inspired by the science and they get competitive and then just... You know, you set it and forget it, man. After that, it's all she wrote. They really get into it and they love it. So uh, for me, the next step is to continue that in an assistant professor position. Um, so next year, I'll be going on the market looking for uh, faculty positions, professor of biology. Um, at, I don't know whether I'm sort of in the going to like an R01 school, like a Chapel Hill or a Duke or whether I'm sort of more fit for like a, um, a Davidson or a Appalachian State University. Um, I'm kind of, I'm going to test all those because I think at each of those levels, I could do different things. Um, but what I don't want to sacrifice is teaching. I love teaching and I love research. I want to do both. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's just teaching colleges where you'll be teaching mostly. Sometimes you're doing 100% research. I want to find a university where I can balance both those out really nicely. So that'll be next year. All awesome. in on the market. Awesome. Well, good luck. Um, all right, we'll move on. Let's get you out of here and back to the, to the fam. Um, so if anyone is looking into studying uh, and entering the field of biology, are there any materials you can recommend books, podcasts, shows, whatever? Uh, as far as books, podcasts, shows, I'm not sure. Um, what I do recommend is them finding people and talking to them. Um, so what I do is when I meet with the um, undergraduates the first time, I say, go out and make a connection. Um, and I can help with that, right? So talk to somebody who's doing it. Um, if you're a high school student, you know, find somebody um, that's at a college in the biology, right? Talk to them what their experience is like. If you're an undergraduate, try to find undergraduates uh, or graduate students that are transitioning in that are there in the trenches, um, talk to professors about it. Um, get online and see there are some high school programs where you can go and work in the summers at colleges um, and doing little internships in the labs and stuff. 
that sort of stuff is where you're going to get your information from. Uh, I think, yeah. So you just got to talk to people. Um, talk to professors. They'll they'll point you in the right direction. Um, I can give you my contact information. If anybody on the show wants to contact me, I'd be more than happy um, to point them towards people. But you've got to find people who are doing different things in science and talk to them um, because everybody's experience is, is, is really different. Uh, and you'll find something that, you know, you can relate to, but you got to talk to people. You got to get out there and, and meet people and talk to them. That's great advice, man. Um, so let's see, let's get into, we got a few questions, so we'll, we'll hop into it and, uh, and get as many as we can. Uh, first one is pretty funny. Would you ever do a Ted talk? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> uh, you might reconsider that after you watched the episode uh, with my friend, uh, Dr. Jay Sanguinetti, who actually did a yeah, we'll TED see. Talk. He said it was a lot more nerve wracking. It be decided. Yeah. Because yeah. he said you have to memorize. Like, it's not something like you memorize everything you have to say. Wow. No, yeah. I usually just freestyle it. Yeah, yeah. That's how <laughs> what he said he did too. And he's like, it was nerve wracking because you had to like, it was like a show, like verbatim. You had to know exactly what you were going to say at what time and oh, everything. Okay. Well, we'll see. Maybe the verdict's still out on that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what countries have you visited? Ah, countries. So just, just is as a scientist, I've had the opportunity to go to Canada, Cancun, Mexico, uh, I went to Barcelona and presented my research Spain um, last year, uh, and that was really awesome. So every other year, I get a chance to travel to an international conference, and I think Beijing is the C. Elegance conference next year. Um, so um, not, a, not a ton of places I've been internationally, but uh, in the next 10 years, every other year, I'll probably be going to some other country. Um, so by far the funnest and, and furthest place I've gone has been Barcelona, Spain, which I loved. Um, I would definitely go back. Awesome. Uh, one of our, one of our listeners is, uh, is from Spain and right. they, they have a good time in Spain cause he's always out at some festival event. Um, sounds fun. All right. So what's the most fascinating aspect of your research? Oh, the most fascinating aspect, um, right now is just, um, understanding how what you are doing now could affect your great 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 grandchildren um to me is 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 fascinating so we're uncovering things that are inherited for many 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 generations and it could be some stressful situation that you have in your life um could change the behavior of your great great grandchildren um and we are trying to understand that mechanism and we're getting close to understanding those mechanisms. So for me, that's the most exciting thing for me right now is to understand how these changes in chromatin and epigenetics can be passed down for many generations. Um, so then I can blame my great, great, great grandfather for all the problems that I have with my health right now. <laughs> but to me, this is, that's the most fascinating thing right now is to understand, um, how the environment can influence you and how that can be transitioned down to your great, great grandchildren. Um, and the genes be the same. Um, so to me, that's the fascinating thing. Awesome. And we have one last one, which I'm pretty sure I know the answer to. If you could only choose one, would you rather conduct research or teach slash mentor for the rest of your life and why? Oh, wow. Finger. Oh, that's a tough one. Huh? man i'm not gonna i i, I guess i huh, i guess i would teach man that's hard i'm thought, trying I, to purposely not have to make that decision yeah. uh, um with teaching i you know so when i teach i treat it like my research honestly um i do bring my research into the lab and when i'm teaching i'm always thinking about how can i assess learning like i think about my teaching strategies as experiments so i'm experimenting on the students that i'm teaching and I try to design my assessments um, to figure out with controls and stuff to try to figure out is what I'm doing working in the classroom, right? The same way is this experiment working? You have to have your sets of controls. So for me, um, I think it would probably be teaching um, because whenever I get burned out at the bench with research, I plug in and recharge with the teaching. That's why I want a healthy mixture of both. Um, and that's what I'm going to go after. Um, and I'm not going to settle for anything less, I don't think. But if I had to choose, probably teaching. Um, yeah. 
Awesome. That's a hard question. That's a good, great question. Yeah, it's a th- I was tough. When I was leaning toward it, I was thinking maybe more teacher, but uh, yeah, I don't know, only, man. only I, probably I about too, man. only the research about, like, makes me a good teacher. Yeah, yeah so. there you go. All right, man. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and I do want to follow back up with you and have you on again sometime and, and yep. let us know where you are in the research and, and where you landed the, the gig, man. So, uh, Absolutely, yeah, man. man. I'll be happy to do it. Awesome. Well, I'll let you get back and uh, get a good night's sleep because I'm sure you're a lot busier than I probably am. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> we'll see you later, Brandon. Yeah, I hope you have man. a good I'm one. Go veg out on the TV, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Have a good Thanks one. Thanks for having me on, Jay. Yeah, have, have a good have one. Have a blast. Bye. Yep. Bye. It's chat song time. It's chat song time.